So today we're talking about uh, listening at the cocktail party with deep neural networks and TensorFlow. And the agenda is I'm going to talk about the cocktail party problem, about how to solve it, and then the next vision, the future vision and some related use cases. I will also look at some of the barriers to adopting uh, deep learning at the edge in embedded devices, and then how can these barriers be overcome. So the vision is speech separation, and I'll expand that later to speech separation at the edge. Uh, the problem that I'm going to talk about is if there are several people talking at the same time, uh, you and I, we can sort of tune into um, one conversation or the other conversation, if it's at an airport or a restaurant or meeting. However, if you are hearing impaired, then everything becomes noise and it becomes garbled. So that's really the, the problem, main problem I'm looking at, but later on I'm, go I'm going to uh, talk about how can you expand the, the methodology I'm using to other very exciting use cases, maybe automating parts of the air traffic control system. Okay, let's listen to some uh, mixed sounds. This is in Danish. I've translated the two sentences for you. It was a great Halloween party that is spoken by male one and the nest was built with small twigs is uh, uh, spoken by the female. And they're talking at the same time. Is it being... Can you hear it? I can't hear it. Okay, just a second. Um, good. So that's just mixed audio, right? You're taking two soundtracks and mixing, mixing them together. And the solution is separating the two soundtracks into separate tracks and feeding them to each ear. If you do that, a hearing impaired person can usually make sense of it. So I, maybe I should say that I had worked for a hearing aid company the past year, but I'm trying to expand the use case. So these uh, two, two have been uh, separate, these two sentences have been separated with TensorFlow. And he's saying it was a great Halloween party and you might be able to hear a little artifact in the background, this female speaking. So it's not 100% perfect, but it's actually good enough. We are, I mean, the results, I'm, myself, I'm pretty impressed. And I have some even better examples to show you. Here's the, uh, the female. So you can clearly hear her, the male is, uh, you can also hear the male a little in the background. So that's the solution, right? We want to move in that direction and at the moment it works in a lab, but uh, it should preferably work in the field. So the approach that I'm using, the deep neural network approach is, I'm starting with two um, audio bytes, one from the female and one from the male, or two random speakers, and I'm mixing them together to one track. So now I have a mixed audio track. The next step is making a, a transformation, a short time Fourier transform, and I'm getting a spectrogram. It almost looks like an image, and then probably if you know deep neural network, your home, I mean, this could be a convolutional neural network maybe that you could use. It's not an image, it's really just a matrix of complex numbers. And then you feed that into the deep neural network. Uh, what you get out of it once the model has been trained is a mask. And that mask you can convert to the two separate uh, spectrograms. And from these two spectrograms you can use an inverse um, short time Fourier transform to get to the audio track. So that's the approach that I've been using. 
oh, I don't know if I have an audio adapter. No, no, that's not the one. No, don't, don't, I don't think that's an audio. Uh, maybe it is, but let me see. I have a lot of, is it audio, even on an, that Mac? So I can, I'll just go quickly back here. No, I'll play it. I'll just try, just to, ah, it doesn't matter. You have to select it, uh, it's going out to HDMI, you have to select the headphone. Oh, headphone. Settings. Settings. I'll just try it. Let's see, uh, audio. And I don't know, this one, maybe? No. Output. Output. Yep. Oh, then I'll have to change that here. Output. Headphones. Yeah. Okay. I'll try. I, I can get through the presentation without that. It's in Danish anyway. Um, file. Uh, where am I? You. Yes, that's it. Or if someone, if any of you really want to hear it, you can come up afterwards and listen. So to to create a solution, there are a lot of typical uh, deep learning tasks that you would go through, and I just have a short list of them. You have to. Um, you have to establish a platform, you have to get a data set, you have to look at the transformations, you have to um, code um, the, uh, what you call it, the model and the neural network. Um, then you have to do the training, a lot of trainings. I have uh, I've trained hundreds, of, I'm not saying not thousands of models, but quite a few models, and then you do evaluations and then predictions or inferences. I'll, I'll get into each of these tasks. So in terms of platform uh, selection, I'm just going to quickly go through our history because we've been through a lot of changes. We started with Keras and Fiano, uh, but then, uh, and I wasn't involved at that time, but then the development of Fiano was halted um, and therefore we had to find another framework. And, and I really recommended at that time TensorFlow, it was the most widely used framework uh, and it also um, supported Keras. So the conversion was really easy and quick. Um, it took a few days, I think, and there were, I mean, very few changes really because it's both Keras. The next step, a few months after the conversion, uh, Google included Keras in um, TensorFlow, and then I had to convert once again, but that was even easier. Um, because uh, it was just changing some import statements. I think there were a few more things. Actually, there was something with floating points and integers and a little like that, but it was not too complicated. Um, so that's where we are now. The next step, if you want to bring it into production and you look at the TensorFlow website, then it says uh, you should use TensorFlow Extended for production and it also says if you want to use TensorFlow Extended, it's best to use the uh, Estimator API uh, because Keras is not fully supported. However, when I talked to some, one Google person during this conference, he was saying, oh, we are, we are really going forward with the Keras API. But if you look at the TensorFlow website, it says that TensorFlow Extended which is a sort of a TensorFlow pipeline that Google has open sourced or partially open sourced. Um, they are really s uh, recommending the Estimator API. So I'm still, uh, I'll talk a little more about the pipeline, but not too much. There have been a lot of talks about pipelines here. Um, so you probably already know a lot about the pipelines. So for, I mean, we had to, Initially, we built most of our own modules for the pipelines, but now, fortunately, there are frameworks for that. The data set, uh, it, I'm highly critical of this data set, but this is sort of a data set that was forced on me. It only consisted of six speakers. However, the good thing, it was recorded in a studio. The good thing is we are getting some decent results in a, in a what do you call it, narrow scope. 
Uh, there were three males and three females. There were 13 lists of sentences, each list with uh, 20 sentences and, and six speakers. So it's about 10 minutes of talk per speaker. Each sentence is about two seconds. I'll talk more about data sets later. Uh, in terms of feature engineering, there were a few small changes uh, or, or what you call it transformations, but the main transformation and, 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 and data manipulation, of course you have to have to get it in the same bit format and the same audio formats, um, but the main transformation is the short time for rear transform. All the audio files were also cut to two seconds. So you can see we were using the Librosa library and uh, I just defined that I only wanted two seconds uh, of, the, of that sound clip. And then the short time for rear transform is really simple. I mean, there are some parameters. I haven't shown you all the parameters here, uh, but it's really easy to get a spectrogram from, from the WAV file. In terms of models, we used several models. We tried several models and architectures, especially uh, well, not especially. There were three or four models that we mostly used. We tried with a fully connected neural network, a, a dense network, then an LSTM, a GRU, and a recurrent, uh, what's it called? A convolutional recurrent neural network, a combination. And the results were more or less the same. There wasn't much difference in terms of quality for the sound separation, a little. Um, so, and since the fully connected neural network, we could train it in 45 minutes and the other networks took much longer to train, we mostly worked with that fully connected neural network. I'll show you briefly the architecture. There are four layers. Uh, this is written by Keras and here is, is the code for it. Uh, and you can see there's a loop in, in the middle. Uh, it loops four times, there are four hidden layers. So each layer cons consists of the dense um, layer with 1,024 neurons. There is a sigmoid activation function. Uh, there's batch normal normalization and drop dropout, and I'm using an atom optimizer and uh, a mean squared error loss function. So it's fairly simple neural network. It's not super advanced or complicated uh, at the moment. It's, it's very straightforward. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you uh, are or ha have worked with deep learning and uh, TensorFlow? Okay, great. Oh, quite a few. So we trained a lot of models. These are some of the main parameters. A lot of the parameters were really for identifying uh, the data, uh, the input and the output directories and, and the data we wanted to use. So when we trained, when we created a model, one parameter was, in this case, the FDNN is the fully connected neural network. Uh, that was one parameter. And then we are, um, we are, we are specifying which, which speakers we want to use as input, in this case, M1 and F1. And we're doing 200 epochs. That was typical and standard. And we had a data augmentation ratio because we had very little data, but I think that even if you have a data uh, augmentation ratio and we are getting decent results in this narrow scope, it's not a very generalizable model. So this is very straightforward. If you work with Keras, uh, we're using a callback list. Um, TensorBoard is great. If you, uh, so for those who haven't heard of TensorBoard, you get an insight into what's happening during the training. You see the loss function as you are training and you can get some insight into the different layers of uh, how many weights maybe are, are zero or uh, you get some histograms of the different layers also. And you can get a, a really detailed uh, visual diagram of that uh, neural network, very detailed. Even though it looks simple, uh, what goes into that generator was actually pretty complicated and it took a long time. And there are the spectrogram on one side, right? And then there's the label or the mask. But getting at all that code and, and getting the data in and, in and the right format and using the right algorithms for getting the mask, it was, a, I thought, a little complicated. 
So now we have the evaluation and prediction. So the finished models, they were typically t uh, 52 megabytes in size once they were trained. And it took about 45 minutes on a cloud computer, on a desktop computer. And there were about a total of 4.5 million parameters. I'll get back to that in a little while. That might be important. So the, some of the parameters for the evaluation, so the inference. Again, we are specifying the three first one specifies the model we are using. So in this case, it's the same model. Uh, it's an, a fully connected model, and we're using M1 and F1 as input data. And in this case, we are also trying to predict sentences that were spoken by the same speaker pair. And we would expect good results. Uh, if we were using another speaker pair in the prediction, we wouldn't expect as good results. And we listen to some examples of that. So if you look at the, the column that says M1, F1, that is the trained model. And it's an FDNN model. Uh, with the M1, F1 speaker pair. And we're also trying to, if you look at the row index, where it says 6.84 and 8.01, uh, the M1, F1 also indicates that this is what we're using. These are this, we're using sentences from M1 and F1 for the prediction. The numbers represent the signal to distortion ratio. It's a little like a signal to noise ratio. Uh, so we're not using accuracy. Uh, but we're using this um, metric, and there are some algorithms for that. Uh, and these numbers represent an average of 1,200 inferences. If you look at the bottom cell where it says minus 3.94, so if it's really close to zero, it's bad. There's almost no separation, and it sounds like both are talking at the same time. If it's 11, it's pretty good. Let me see. So if you look at these columns, the first one, the first column is the model. The second is the test example. And I'm, the, model, the models are all the same. The test examples vary a little. Um, and then there's the SDR value. The best that we have here, these are not averages. It's, it's, it's some of the best and worst examples. So let's see, let's listen to this 15.59. Okay, let me see if I can increase the volume. What was it here? Bussen kan ikke komme frem. So he says um, the bus is not able to get through. And there's almost no artifact at all. So it's really good. And even though we trained on M1, F1, I'm separating, this is male three, and I wouldn't expect getting a really great result. So if that was consistent, then the, the model would, would be quite generalizable. But it's not consistent. So let's listen to this other separation that's uh, very close to zero. No separation at all, right? So the model, and, and we did many, many, many inferences, hundreds of, no, thousands, many thousands. Um, and so we have a lot of, um, um, what you call it, data, and uh, we, we, I mean, we have some research publications about this. Bussen kan ikke komme frem. Børnene er kommet hjem med middagstid. Arbejdet er hårdt og krævende. So what's the future direction here? The, the goal or the vision is to get um, speech separation at the edge, real time. And here are some related use cases. So one is the speech separation, right? If you can do speech separation, imagine if it's not two speakers, but one speaker, and the rest is the noise around the speaker. So if you could cut all the background noise and the other speakers away and just hear one speaker clearly, that would be great in an airport. It would be great. Another use case would be, uh, let's say you're an air traffic controller and you are talking, there's a lot of noise on the line, so if you could speak to the pilot and, it, it, and you only hear the voice and know <laughs> that, that would be a, an interesting use case. Another use case, not that I want to work for a burger chain, but if you have a burger chain 
and you have a drive through and people are ordering and speaking into a speaker, the cashier might not be able to hear what's being said, so if you can cut the, the noise from the, the street away, that, that would be another use case. So these are speech to speech. There are some other use cases that are slightly related where you have speech to text. Let me show you an example. This is not our example. It's one I borrowed from a paper by Google and it's called um, Looking to Listen. Oops. Okay, so the task is um, given a video, any person who you see talking, their audio gets cleaned up and everything else gets suppressed. Okay, so the task is um, given a video, any person who you see talking, their audio gets cleaned up and everything else gets suppressed. I think this is really impressive. So, the task is uh... another somewhat related use case um, is here I'm playing an air traffic controller, uh, giving instructions to a small aircraft. It's an artificial example because there's no background noise and I'm speaking really slowly. Cessna 172 Romeo Golf, turn right heading 053 degrees, descend and maintain 5,000 feet. You are cleared for the Van Nuys ILS runway 16 right approach. So this type of application, which is speech to text, has a wide application. So imagine you're in a meeting and you can do transcription. Imagine if each speaker is color coded. Uh, so you can easily recognize the different speakers, then, then deaf people could follow this conversation. This is, by the way, a Google program that you can download to Android phones called Live Transcribe. So what are some of the barriers uh, to tiny ML adoption, meaning AI on the edge on the smartphone or maybe in, even in smaller devices? One is the production environment. I mean, there are a lot of work going into it. it. I think the problem has been solved, but there's just a lot of work going into it. And if you're not, I mean, the company I work for, there are only 20,000 people, so it's not really that huge. Um, part of it is the data set. When I talk about barriers, it's specifically for my use case and my company, right? Uh, the data set we are using is lousy. Google would be using an ex I mean, a data set with hundreds of thousands or maybe even a, a, a million examples or more. Um, so I'll talk about each of these items here. I will not talk much about this because I... How many of you have seen presentations with pipelines? Okay, many of you. Um, but these are some of the tasks that goes into a, 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 a deep learning project. And they are organized into a pipeline. In this case, this is the TensorFlow extended pipeline. I haven't looked at the MLflow pipeline yet, but that seems very promising. So I probably will look into it and see, can I use that? But the TensorFlow is sort of what I have focused on now, TensorFlow extended. And then, of course, you have to wrap it with some other tasks uh, to get a production environment, and then you have to integrate it into, into your enterprise architecture. So there's a lot of work there. In terms of data sets, this is what I think is uh, not the best data set. Um, one thing you could do is you could take a, you could build your own, own data set, so just download 100 uh, speeches, maybe one hour speeches, and then you would chop it into two second pieces and you would have a much larger and more varied data set than the one I used. So that's uh, attempting to, to try that just to see what happens. And Mozilla has a great data set called Common Voice and they have almost 40,000 voices. You can contribute your own voice to that data set by reading some sentences. Um, and then Google has a few data sets and there are other data sets out there, voice data sets. 
the approach or other approaches, and one approach, again, that I found uh, on Google's site is um, from the Looking to Listen project, is they are filming the speakers while they're talking. So they actually have three neural networks. They're feeding the two video streams to each, two separate networks, networks and the audio stream. So the first half is very different from what I'm doing, but the second half is exactly the same. And they, they are the ones that are getting these really great results for uh, separating noise and, uh, and speech. In terms of separating speech and speech, I don't think their method is getting results that are much better than what I'm getting. Uh, and they are using a bi-directional LSTM, which means it cannot be real time. Uh, it has to go both ways somehow, and therefore uh, it can't be real time. So let's look a little at the, the devices that are needed and the story um, that, I, that we are going through and where we are and, and what's in the future there. So initially we started with uh, building the solution in the cloud, and both the training and the inference was in the cloud and that's, that worked out quite well. Oops. Next thing, I wanted to try it on a desktop with a GPU, a 1080 GTX. That worked out pretty well too. The training took 45 minutes. Um, and for 200 epochs, next I tried on a MacBook Pro and that didn't work out. I mean, it took 15 hours to train, train it. And if you want to do a lot of iterations, then that's not okay and at some point, I mean, at the moment we are building, or we, 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 we would have to build a model for each customer. And if we have one million customers, we, we, we would need to build one million models. And uh, that would require a lot of uh, laptops if it takes 15 hours. So that's where we are now. The inference, the laptop can handle the inference and it seems to be fine. The next step, and I haven't, we're not there yet, but um, what was it I, I wanted to show you? I was at this uh, Google TensorFlow Summit conference and they gave everyone this little edge, uh, what's it called, TPU. And it's a neural processing unit. You can connect it to a Raspberry Pi and it would accelerate. It's really an AI chip of some sort. Um, so, if you look in the upper right corner uh, on the coin, uh, that's, that's the uh, Edge TPU chip, but it's also on sentient side. They're also making small processors, neural um, processing units. They have almost the same picture. Um, and so it looks promising. So both the Google Edge TPU, I could use it to um, pitch the managers and say, look, they, they want to see it go further, right, from the desktop to something else, maybe a smaller device, a Raspberry Pi, whatever. They just want to see it, that, that we're able to move towards the end goal. Um, and maybe a, a good intermediate goal would be a smartphone. The sentient neural decision processor, it also runs TensorFlow Lite. However, it can only handle 500 thousand parameters and at the moment I have 4.5 million parameters but I, I'm just thinking more slow in, in a few years, right? It shouldn't be a problem. Also, we are seeing uh, in the latest smartphones with the Snapdragon 855 or the Huawei uh, Kirin 990, there's a lot of AI power built in and if you have how many of you have Android phones? And probably you could do this, something similar on, on iPhones. But I have I downloaded some um, TensorFlow apps. You can, I know, you, can you run TensorFlow Lite on iPhones? Oh, okay. But you can run TensorFlow Lite on uh, an Android phone. And uh, so you can actually do some close to real time inference for example, you can do object detection with this app. You just point it at people and it will say, 
people and then you pointed at a book and it would say book and then you pointed at um, a door and it would say a dustbin or whatever. But as, I mean, it's not 100% correct, but uh, <laughs> almost. So the, the, um, what's also needed is a intensive flow light. It's not completely ready yet, but it, it can, it's especially geared towards image recognition uh, image classification and object detection. But you can do more things in TensorFlow Lite. And I've spoken with some of the Google people and they're very interested in our use case. So if our customer really wants to work with them, they, they see it as a great accessibility feature. And then there's the latency issue um, that for real-time speech separation to be not annoyable, it has to be less, the latency has to be less than 20 milliseconds. So it's a little like the cars, right? If you're autonomous cars, I think they were talking about the BMW team were talking about 25 milliseconds uh, or a frame rate of 50 frames per, per second. Okay, so in summary, I showed you a little about the cocktail party problem. I, showed you how we are solving it in a lab environment at the moment, and I've, I've also shown you what's the future vision and related use cases, um, and then uh, what are some of the barriers to adopting a deep neural network and how can we start to overcome these barriers and do solutions exist. So there's some time for questions. And I also want to thank you before everyone is leaving. I mean, safe travels. And uh, if you're going to a party in the near future, remember to bring TensorFlow and a deep neural network, and then you can listen in and understand everything that's being said. Thanks, Christian. We have a few minutes for Q&A before we have to wrap up. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question. Hello, uh, pretty nice work you have done. Uh, one question is uh, just from my little background on that, just to know, did you apply ICA at any point, which is very used for these kind of cocktail parties problems? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know ICA, ICA very well but I think they had been using that previously. So what we are trying to do is, we're trying to do it with deep learning and explore what can be done there. I think the research center where I've been working, uh, that they have used ICA at some point. Can you just remind me ICA stands it's for? Independent component analysis, uh, mm -hmm. non-Gaussian form, so it looks for independent things. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fast filter. Yeah. I don't know if it's fast. And, and that can also separate, right? Yes. Uh, yes. And I don't know how it compares. I, I have not. Uh, it was quite fast. Uh, okay. I, I probably, I, I didn't try as much as you have been doing. So, mm -hmm. so I, haven't, I've, I might have tried it a little once, but I haven't done any extensive tests with it. I, I'm sure if you ask my manager, he would know a lot about it. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, with respect to ICA, I think one of the problems is the footprint, and if you compare it to, co to deploying your DNN, uh, the promising part there is, is, is the low footprint uh, there. So, so that's maybe uh, an answer from my side. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, it, this was a great talk, and I mean, this is really uh, showing AI thank for you. good, so, so thank you for, uh, for that. I was wondering, though, uh, you were mentioning that you had a very small uh, data set that you were working uh, on. Have you considered, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, synthetic voices? I mean, if you use Poly or Google Wave, uh, uh, what is it, the Google Wave generation, uh, so, so you enter your text and it's going to produce all kinds of uh, uh, voices for you and you could, what is it, apply a filter yourself on it so that you do have extra noise or ah, different okay. pitches, et cetera. So you say I could um, uh, maybe create a little program that would, with, with some text and then it could generate different voices? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, Poly it, and, and, and Google WaveNet are, I mean, I, I am pretty flabbergasted with what they produce. Yes. I mean, it's, it's really natural voice. I haven't looked producing. into it in detail, but it, it, again, it should be on my list of things to try. Yeah, <laughs> okay.
Hi. Hi. Could you explain why you would want the training of the models to take place on the smaller and smaller devices? Because it seems to me like you could just train the network in a cluster and then push the finished product to an edge device. Yeah, good, good question. I, um, I didn't express myself clearly. The training would take place on, uh, in the cloud, right? And it's only inference that would take place on a smartphone or in a headset or a hearing device. Okay, so why was that part of your uh, trials then, to, to train on the desktop and the laptop and so forth? No, I think that if you look at the small print, hopefully I, I did try to train on the laptop. I just tried it to see what would happen and do the inference, and that worked well. If you look at the smartphone, it just says inference, not training. And it might not be very clear, this slide, I just tried it on the laptop. What, what would happen? Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed the application. Uh, so I was wondering if you noticed any large differences in your performance results when um, using input tracks where the speakers were of a, a different gender as opposed to the, the example track they used where the speakers were of a different gender. Because I was thinking like for a, a male speaker and a female speaker, intuitively the, the biggest difference would be the, the pitch. So I guess that the weights or, or the filters in the case of convolutional yes. networks would try to imitate like high, a high frequency filter and a low frequency filter. So I was wondering if that would yeah, affect the, the tracks where you have different... Uh, You're absolutely things. right. Uh, there was a, a huge difference. So if you had a male and a female, it would be, in general, uh, it, would be a, it would be more able to separate the voices. And if you had two males or two females, it would be a little more difficult. But that's where, we want, where I wanted, um, where I would have to get a much larger data, data set. I want to get one that's really generalizable. Thank you. Okay, we've still got two more minutes. I think there's one here. It's, it's a question I forgot. I mean, the training bit is now on a voice pair, but uh, are you thinking about what is it, mixing 15 voices or 30 voices as well, a bit similar to what Google was, uh, was showing? Yeah, I have to extend it. So we're not just so we don't just have two voices, but let's, I mean, there are different scenarios, right? There's one voice versus everything else. You want to cut everything else away except for that one voice. Yeah. So that's, a, it's actually a little complicated as far, I mean, because there's so many different variations of noise, right? Noise with speech, noise without speech, and in terms of noise or, I say it's noise, but it could also be music, right? And uh, so th there's just the pitch spectrum for noise is much larger than for speech. Yeah, so, so that's where the variations. A, a, an extra device like a video device would kick in so that you could focus on what part am I, do I need to pick up here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, one, one more question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to maybe clarify or ask for my own understanding. The inference would take place every time a new speaker is encountered or only once, um, I guess, in the lifetime of the device? Um, no, the inference, let's say you have a scenario. You are somewhere at a meeting or you're listening to someone talking to you. The way I see it, at the moment, it's artificially, it's a little artificial, although we are arguing that we can do it in 20 milliseconds in, with a very short latency. It's still sort of stacked together. So when you stack it all together and, and you do the inference, it's pretty quick, but it's actually been stacked. So the inference would have to take place every 20 milliseconds. You'd have to take tiny bytes, right? If you want to do it real time, maybe in less than 20 milliseconds. You would take a sound bite of 20 milliseconds and then do inference on that, but then it would have to be smoothed out with the, with, with the audio that comes after it. But what you are inferring is a, a filter, a frequency mask, right? Yes. Which, um, so once you've inferred it, you could apply the same mask for the next, I don't know, 
minute, several seconds, or would you dynamically update it? We probably would update it every 20 seconds. Maybe we can, I, I haven't tried, but there are some possibilities and experimentation that has to go on, right? Um, also to get a really good solution and maybe other research organization are much further than, than, than we are. Thank you.